welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church. I'm so excited to get to see all of your faces. Even if it's just half of your face, I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you. And thank you so much for being willing to come in wearing masks. I know it's annoying, but it's awesome to be able to see everybody in person and to help keep each other safe. Um, we'll probably keep wearing them until the state of emergency is over somewhere in that. We'll see how it goes. Um, and uh, thank you all. So good to see you. Um, here at Braddock Street, we are followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. I'm Annalise. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street. I'm so glad that you're here. And for all of our folks online, we're so glad that you are here watching with us as well this morning. Um, remember that if you're online, you can send us comments. You can like and comment and share. Let us know that you're with us. Um, we are so glad that everyone is here together in worship. We will get to hear a little bit from our graduates today. And so after we sing this next song, which will be You Never Let Go, we'll invite Trey to come up and tell us a little bit more about some words from our graduates. Let's worship.
Good morning. My name is Trey Kraft, and I am graduating from Hanley High School and attending Hampton Sydney this fall. I have the honor this morning of representing all of the graduates as the outgoing black president. As such, I would like to give an official thank you. Thank you for your prayers, for your financial support, and for all the times you helped to empower youth to learn and grow as working members of this congregation. I have learned a lot from my time at Braddock Street, both through my time serving on church committees and being a part of Black. However, my faith has not always been as strong as it is now. During middle school, I went through the motions and didn't truly pay attention during Sunday school or Black. Even though I answered the questions that were asked, I never, I wasn't really paying attention to what they meant in my life. However, during a mission trip to Guatemala, I had a dream about a little kid who I ended up meeting the next day. Similar to how God revealed who Samuel was supposed to anoint, God showed me who I was supposed to help during my trip. This vision opened my eyes and made me realize all the different ways that God is present in my life. Without the generosity of the church, I would have never been able to go on this trip and have my eyes opened up to the Lord. So on behalf of all of us, thank you. Continue to pray for us as we head into the next phase of our lives, and we will be back to visit and to continue to grow with you. Amen. Thank you so much, Trey. And we're going to send Trey off in a moment to join the rest of the graduates where Kristen is honoring them with some gifts from the congregation. But before he leaves, um, we would like him and anyone else who is graduating from any level of education um, this year, if you would all please stand. Stand up. And we are going to pray together over all of our graduates. Um, our words will show up there in a second, I think. Yes, there we go. And <laughs> we're going to pray together over our graduates. Please pray with me. Dear God, we pray that you would give each of these graduates wisdom and direction in making decisions and in each new situation and journey you have for them now. Teach them to listen closely to your voice that they would have a heart to obey your word and have a desire to make the right choices. We pray that these we love so much would walk faithfully and diligently in your ways. We ask that you would make their footsteps firm, that your word would be constant lamp for their feet and a light to their path. May they sense the freshness of your spirit over their lives in amazing ways, and may they be strengthened and stilled with hope for the new roads you have in store. We ask for your wisdom and clear direction over their lives, that you would give them understanding beyond their years. We ask for you to open doors that need to be opened and to close the one that should be shut tight. Allow every gift and treasure you have placed inside their lives to grow, develop, and flourish to bring you glory. We celebrate these graduates this day and give you thanks, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Trey. Congratulations. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among my sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Can we come peaceably? He said, Peaceably? I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Samuel pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. 
Jesse made seven of his friends sons to cast the four kingdom and came and said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of you. Samuel said to Jesse, Are you all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is sleeping with you. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for he will sit down to listen to you. He sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and skin. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for the people. We would like to invite Dylan, Michael Smith, and loved ones, family, to come forward for baptism. All right, here we are. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift to us, offered to us without price. <laughs> On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If you do, please say, I do. I do. do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and depression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please say, I do. I do. do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has offered to people of all ages, nations, and races. If, if so, please say, I do. I do. And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself and profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life? If so, please say, I will. So you've heard the parents make their commitment, and there's a commitment of the congregation do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We, we do. do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Dylan now before you in your care? With God's, God's help, help, we will, we will proclaim, proclaim the good, good news and, and live, live according, according to the example of Christ. Of Christ. We, we will, will surround this person with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we ask that you pour a special blessing upon this water, set it apart for your holy purpose of including Dylan now before you into the family of Jesus Christ. Amen. And what is Dylan's full name? Dylan Michael Smith. All right, Dylan. Here we go. Other way. There we go. <laughs> I think he grew during the pandemic. All right, we'll do this quick. Dylan Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say amen. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> Too early in the morning. Sorry. Let us pray. God, your grace comes to us before we're ready. 
We thank you, Lord, for Dylan's life. We thank you for the witness of his parents and the witness of this church, that Dylan might see what it's like to follow Christ. We ask an outpouring of protection and guidance and blessing upon Dylan this day and forevermore. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. Can we just congratulate Dylan? There are many amazing things that the gifts that you give here at Braddock Street are able to do. And one of those that we want to lift up for you today is our youth ministry. As you saw from Trey getting to stand here and as you may have experienced through your own children or through your own experience here at Braddock Street, we do amazing things here in our youth ministry. And all of that is made possible by the gifts that you give. So thank you you so much. And um, you will see options here on your screen for ways that you can give. We also do have baskets in the back if you have a physical gift that you would like to give today. Um, And so we are so thankful for everything that you are able to give. And we will worship um, together through our giving as we hear this offer.
Well, thanks to everybody for being here today. Um, so much, so much to celebrate. Jason, I think I'm going to move your stuff here. Hopefully you can get it back where you need it. I told somebody today, we're not sure what we're doing. It's been so long since we did it here in person. Thank you for bearing with us. So much to celebrate. Our graduates, of course. Uh, we're remembering those who've served our, our nation. And all at the same time, coming back face-to-face, in person, in worship. Thank you for being here. Um, And thank you as well for worshiping online. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for giving us signs of hope and deliverance. We knew you would always deliver us. That's your promise. It is we who have to have the human patience to wait on your deliverance. But thank you. And now open our hearts and our minds to what you would say to each one of us this day. In the powerful name of Jesus, who overcomes all things, even death. Amen. The old saying is, you can't judge a book by its cover. But the title usually gives you a clue. And so there are certain things that we can tell at first glance, and yet we all know we also have to look deeper over time. This is a picture that a friend of mine posted on Facebook recently. Um, This is his right knee, and all of us who are lay people go, ooh. But any of us who have had surgery, we look, oh, there's betadine, right, and staples. So we know that the individual had surgery. On the outside, we say, ooh. But here's another picture of the same knee. On the inside, you see some healing taking place. People like me who are lay folks, if I don't see swelling and I don't see bruising or bleeding, I would think that that a knee is just fine. But there are things going on inside all of us all the time. It may look terrible on the outside, but there might be healing going on on the inside. People with a trained eye, of course, are armed with things like x-rays, magnetic resonance imaging, and training, and they might even be able to feel your knee and tell you something's wrong. And by the way, for all the physical therapists in the room, yes, he will do his rehab. Uh, He spent his career in sports medicine at Virginia Tech and worked with all of their athletes there. Um, So if he doesn't do his rehab, he will be the biggest hypocrite ever. We hear today that the prophet Samuel is asked by God to go and anoint a new king. The context of that is very, very dangerous because Saul is still on the throne. The problem is Saul has lost all his popular support as well as, more importantly, the Spirit of God that seemed to dwell on him. We don't understand why it was with Saul early on and then not with Saul later on, but this is that dangerous time where a leader has lost his support. And we all know what leaders might do when their support is threatened. They begin to attack anything and anyone that would threaten them. That's why Saul is afraid to go do what God has asked him to do. And so he goes to anoint a new king. He is told to go to Jesse, a guy who lives in Bethlehem, and anoint one of his sons. He's not told who at first. And so we read here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 6, when they came, he, Samuel, looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's an- is now, be- surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. Surely this is the guy. Firstborn male child, that was the tradition at the time, right? He's big, he's strong, seems to be a good-looking guy, right? When you go looking for a new king, these are the kinds of assumptions that we might bring to the table. And we say, oh, you silly Samuel. And yet we do the exact same thing ourselves. Study after study psychological and sociological studies tell us that we make assumptions about people at first glance. I didn't have to look very far. Here's one sentence from a study that is posted on the website of the National Institute of Health of all places. The article is called Social Psychological Face Perception. Appearance matters because some facial qualities are so useful in guiding adaptive behavior that even a trace of those qualities can create an impression. In other words, is the person healthy? Is the person angry? Is the person sad? Is the person happy? We can begin to make these assumptions just by looking. That adaptive behavior is there in our brain for a reason. It allows us to to assess the situation very quickly. And sometimes this is very helpful. But we also know, right, 
that first impressions, don't judge a book by its cover, first impressions can be wrong. But don't blame Samuel. We're all guilty. In, change, in choosing leaders, uh, Sean Rosenberg of the University of California, Berkeley, in 2010 did a study where participants were given brochures, political brochures, with two different faces and certain political information. It was posed, this was a hypothetical situation, but it was posed to the participants, one was a Democrat, one was a Republican, here's what their platforms are, right? One was a bit younger, a bit better looking, one was almost as old as me, you know, so didn't have a chance. So what he did in the experiment was give the brochure to half the folks, then switch the pictures and give it to the other half of the folks. You know what happened. 60% of the people chose the better looking candidate, even though it was the exact same information about them just switched. That's who we are. We make assumptions based on our first impression. And it's not just appearance, right? It's manner of speech. My father was a pastor, and when he went to Vanderbilt Divinity School in Nashville, my father was told, get rid of that accent. Dad was from East Tennessee and had that Southern Appalachian hillbilly accent. Think Larry the Cable Guy without the four-letter words. That's what my dad and still his relatives sound like to this day. He got rid of the accent. Why would he have to do that? Because the assumption we make if somebody's from Southern Appalachian has that hillbilly accent is that they are less educated than other folks. Manner of speech makes an impression. That's why every time you turn on a Lexus commercial, have you ever noticed the voiceover is always English? Because we think that's classier, it's European, even though the car's still made by Toyota, right? That's what we think. We, this is, these are our first impressions. People make assumptions on where you're from, what school you go to or went to. They make assumptions on who your family is, if they know anything about your family or the names. They, they make assumptions about the way you dress. We make assumptions based on first impressions. And so Samuel, when he first meets Eliab, thinks, this must be the guy. There's another assumption that we make, personal charisma. I'm so glad you finally get to meet Annalise in, in person. I've known her since she was a child, um, and I've always been impressed with her personal charisma. We tend to choose leaders that have personal charisma. It's not always the case. Back before television, there was a president no, known as uh, Calvin Coolidge. His nickname was Silent Cal because he, just, he was awkward with conversation. He hardly ever said much to anybody. There's even a story that at a White House banquet, as the guests came in line, one woman came before President Coolidge and said, uh, a friend of mine bet me that I couldn't get you to say more than two words, to which he responded, you lose. And still, we elected him president, right? <laughs> so we don't always look at, at first impressions, but they do have us make assumptions. Listen to what God says to Samuel here in 1 Samuel 16, verse verses 6 and 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Beyond x-ray vision, right? The Lord knows us. The Lord created us. We're not told why Eliab or any of the brothers were rejected. We're just, we're just not told. But God must have seen something in David that nobody else could see. And it strikes me that even his own father, Jesse, didn't see it. Samuel ends up saying, you got any more sons? Because none of these has been chosen by the Lord. Oh, there's one out in the back 40, right? Watching the sheep. Now, that was not the hardest job to do. And so evidently, Jesse thought, David doesn't have a chance I'm not even going to bring him before the prophet. There's no point. David, go watch the sheep while we do this important thing. And it ends up being David that God chooses. What do you think God sees in David? We know that God sees courage. We see that later as we're told about the episodes of him with his sling as a young boy, taking on wild animals, and of course, Goliath, the giant of the enemy. We know that there's leadership capability in, in David, right? He's obviously a great military leader. We see personal charisma in David. We see other gifts, even music. 
Saul had David come into his palace to play music to soothe Saul's nerves. We see obedience to God and a bit of humility. Remember the episode as after David has come into power, he becomes a great king. And there are many great leaders who will say, at that point, I need to build a monument to myself so that everybody remembers that I was the greatest that ever was. Caesars did it. Pharaohs did it, right? David, God bless him, says, God, I want to build a house for you. I want to build a temple for you. And God says, no, David, that's not your work. And David obeys. He is obedient to God. He also has at least that bit of humility that says, that's not my place, so I'm not going to do it. Now, God also obviously sees potential for mistakes in David. We all know about the Bathsheba episode. God would have seen that character flaw in him, and God would have known that that might just happen. And yet, God chooses him anyway. Because when we look at ourselves, and that's what today is about, what does God see in you? When we look at ourselves, we see the flaws, don't we? Ten people give you a compliment, one person gives you a criticism, what do you focus on, right? That's how, that's how we're wired. God sees the flaws in us and says, yet there is so much that I can do with you. There is so much inside you that I can use. What does God see in you? And how can you tell? I know we've got a couple more graduates in here. I would say stay with the Word of God. Keep your prayer life going. If you're going off to college, this is an especially sensitive time in your faith life. So find those ministries, churches or campus ministries that can help to feed your soul during this time because those of us who go off to college, this is a time where we're away from our parents. We are confronted with professors who are teaching us to think for ourselves, not according to the standards of learning, right? Critical thinking. And part of that is critical thinking about God. Who is God? Who am I as God's creature? What might God be calling me to do? And that's a tough space. I want to say to any of you who are graduating, any young adults, do not feel like you're weird because you're having a, tr- a tough time figuring out what God wants you to do with your life. Most of us go through that. My parents' generation, people would sign up with the company that was in their town or you know, sign up with some other company after a college degree, and they might just spend 40 years with the same company. That's very, very rare now. Most people change you know, careers Not just different companies, but careers, like four times in their life on average. The young adult years are particularly a challenge as we figure out, what are my gifts? What am I good at? What does God see in me? I was struggling with that as a young adult. Majored in business, was working uh, on an MBA at the College of William & Mary, and working for an electronics manufacturing company in Newport News for several years right out of college. And then I was also struggling with God, you know, what do you want me to do? Because I'm not happy now. That's a really strong indicator. If you're doing something and you're not happy, keep looking, okay? I was in that space. And I went over to what the United Methodists call this annual conference session. My father being a pastor, he and my mom would be there. It was going to be in Hampton that year, so I went over to visit him. And here's one of my father's peers who pulls me aside. Kirk, what are you doing now? I said, I'm working over here at this electronics firm and working on an MBA. He says, when are you going to get out of business school and get in seminary where you belong? Now, I knew this individual, and he's very abrupt. That's just, that's just who he is. <laughs> so, but I, I tucked that in the back of my mind. There's a voice who's saying something about me, seeing something in me. When you're looking at what does God see in you, sometimes it's other people in our lives that we trust who love us. And they're the ones who might be seeing something in us that we just can't see ourselves. So I put that in the back of my mind, and I was still reading the Bible and so forth, and One of my parents, one of my friend's parents, one of my high school buddies, I was still, I went back to Williamsburg, Virginia, where I'd graduated from high school and I was working in Newport News and so forth. And one of my friend's parents asked me if I would teach middle school Sunday school. Now, those adults in the room, put yourself in age 23, you're single, sorting out life, and somebody's asked you to teach middle schoolers Sunday school. I liked it. Did you hear, did you hear uh, uh, Trey talk about the middle school period? I was one of those too, right? Not really cluing in. The kids seemed engaged, and I got fulfillment. Another ding, 
you know, I'm unhappy over here, but I'm happy over here. And then another one of my high school buddies' mothers um, said to me, Kirk, have you ever thought about going into the ministry? And I thought, nobody's saying this to my older brothers. Why are they saying this to me? Other people are seeing something in me that I cannot see myself. Samuel was told by God, there's something in David that's going to make the greatest king that ever was. God saw it. Samuel affirmed it with the, with the anointing. What does God see in you? And I know you may get tired of hearing preachers talk about their call story, and I could tell you story after story after story about my call. I could go on for hours. But it's about your call. What is God calling you to do? It can be anything. Did you know right now we've got 18 devices watching us live? Again, thank you for being with us, worshiping from home. I'm kind of curious as to how many people have gotten very comfortable worshiping in their pajamas. It's okay. I'd be with you probably. I I remember teaching a disciple Bible study class. For those of you unfamiliar with that, it's like 34 weeks long. It's a two-hour class once a week, and you read like a half an hour of Bible six days a week, and then you rest, rest on the Sabbath. It's very transformative, and you learn more about the Scripture than you will ever thought you could. At the end of it, there's this session where we talk about spiritual gifts. We read some of the spiritual gifts, and then we ask each participant to be silent while everybody else in the class names the gifts that they see in that individual. Not just the ones listed in the Bible, but other kinds of gifts, you know? And I remember this one guy, after listening to all that, he says, I don't, I don't know. All I know is internet technology. All I know is computer. I'm just a geek. What does God want with me? <laughs> what he didn't know was at that time, the church that I was serving had a contemporary service like this, and we were using an overhead projector. Does anybody remember those things? Yeah, people as old as I am. Kids, you had these transparent sheets and you put it down. There was a light bulb and it, it shot off of a mirror onto the wall. And it was, it was just black letters on a clear screen. I said, Bob, we need you. <laughs> we need you bad. And he became our screen projector guy. He created the slides. He, he got into the graphics and the colors and all that stuff. It, it became his call. He was there every Sunday. In fact, he was working all week. He would send me notes. Should I do this? Should I do that? And everybody in worship was blessed by his work, and he thought, I'm just a computer geek. See, that's how it works. God sees something in each one of us that can bless the world around us. You may not even see it yourself. Whoever you are, wherever God's calling you to be, there's one gift that God gives to every single one of us. I invite you sometime to sit down and read uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Paul's talking to a church at Corinth, and some of them can speak in tongues and some of them can't. And you know how humans are. The ones that have that gift look at everybody else in the church. I got it and you don't. Right? Adults can be childish. And so Paul goes through this whole chapter talking about how we're all different parts of the one body of Christ. Does everybody have the same gifts? Of course not. And then he starts 1 Corinthians 13 with these words. If I speak with the, mortals and, with the words of mortals and of angels, but do not have what? Love. I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I don't have the spiritual gift of love, I am nothing. Each one of us has that wherever we are in our walk of life. I'm looking at teachers. I'm looking at medical people. I'm looking at kids in school. I'm, each and every one of us has these gifts. So wherever you find yourself, share that gift. The particulars, God can see what you can't even see. God sees the flaws, yes, but God sees beyond the flaws to your potential. And it's all so that Christ's love can be made known in our community. What does God see in you? Let us pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for letting us come back to worship. Thank you for letting us take a moment and look inwardly at the gifts that you see in each of us. I ask you to pour out the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon all who come this morning worshiping online and worshiping in person. Help us to find the gifts that you have given to us to fulfill our calling in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together.
please be, remain seated as we do our prayer. Please continue in prayer with me. Holy God, help us to see the mark of your creation on every person as we meet them. May, they, may that be part of our first impression of every person that we meet. May we see it in ourselves, too. We're thankful that you know who we are, that you made us and look deeply within our hearts. God, today we ask that you would pour out in special measure your presence upon folks that we hold in our hearts, including Ed Orndorff, Harold Ogg, Jim Athern, Steve Lobel, Mary Lou Sprint, Bill Tilling's family, Walter Barr, Diane Wake's family, John Allen, Jeff Stefanowitz, Robbie Robinson, and Robbie Gail Robinson, Bill Vanskoy, Phil Newcomb, Wayne Dix family, John Goodlow, Adrian O'Connor, Mike Ricketts, George Morris, Denny Bromley, Anita Dix family, Harold Madigan, and Holy One, today we lift to you all of those who were victims of COVID-19, and we lift to you their families. We're thankful for all of our healthcare workers and essential services employees and ask that you would continue to keep them safe, continue to give them strength, let them know how thankful we are for their presence. And this weekend as we celebrate Memorial Day, help us to remember all of those who have died because of earthly conflicts of war. Holy One, we ask that you would teach us how to beat our swords into plowshares, make it so that we do not need to learn war anymore. As we list those names this weekend, help us to ensure that no more names need to be added to the list. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now stand as you are able, and we will sing together our closing song.
Thank you so much for being here with us for worship. You have gladdened my heart if, if we haven't gladdened yours. Um, so good to be in God's house with the Spirit of God with us. Next week, we'll be having communion. Uh, we're going to use self-packaged things. We'll put them on tables so you don't have to touch. We'll do what we can uh, for the time being to keep everybody safe. But it's so good to see everyone. So now go. Asking yourself maybe, what does God see in you? What are the gifts that you have been given by God to share that are unique to you. Go to share them. With the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.